you very much. It's, um, it's a huge pleasure for me to be here tonight. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say, as I was thinking about learn, act, and share to prepare for tonight's event, it gave me the chance to do something I really don't have a chance to do, really ever, at least in a structured way. And that was to go back through my career, the majority of which has been spent in France, um, and think about those moments when I really learned something that I could keep with me, something that I could act upon later on in my career to help me advance my goals or get to where I wanted to go. And as I took this long and deep stroll down memory lane, I realized that most of my mind, most of my thoughts were coming back to what I did in my very first job as a young man. And I realized that that was because it was, without a doubt, the most difficult job I had ever had, the most intense, the most physically demanding, and the most emotionally draining job. But it was a job that um, it changed my life and um, put me on um, the track that brought me to where I am today. So um, when I think back, what motivated me to do that? Um, it was when I was growing up in Colorado, in the United States, where I'm from, um, and reading about, this was back in the 1970s, these French chefs that were starting to become well-known even in the heartland of the United States. It was you know, Paul Bocuse, uh, it was Michel Guerard, it was the Toigro brothers, and it was this lady you see here who really caught my attention. I, I, this photo I saw, it was in a Time Magazine article about Paul Bocuse. This is Eugénie Brasier, otherwise known as Le Mère Brasier, who in 1933 did the most, now something that was absolutely incredible. She was able to obtain three Michelin stars in two different restaurants in Lyon in 1933. This had never been done. Um, she was not only a female chef, but she was, this is incredible. And this, this record stood for 65 years until Alain Ducasse finally was able to get two restaurants with three Michelin stars in 1998. So it's hard to overstate what Eugénie Brasier did, Le Mère Brasier. And I saw this photo, you can't really see it, I saw these like smiling guys wearing their talks in this, looks, this big kitchen. It looks like they're having the time of their lives. And I said, I'm gonna become a chef in France. So with the blessing of my uh, unbeknowing parents, what I was getting myself into. I quit college uh, at university after two years, moved to Paris, enrolled in the Ecole Ferrandi, which some of you might know um, in France, which is specialized in cooking, got my Certificat d'Aptitude Professionnelle, and um, I was able to wangle myself with some help some, from friends with connections. A job as a commis in a one Michelin star restaurant, the Bistro 121 on the Rue de la Convention in the 15th arrondissement in Paris. And I was ecstatic. Um, here you see that, that picture you saw of Eugenie uh, Brasier was taken in 1940. This is in 1979. Here you see my colleagues. There's the chef. Of, here's my colleagues. And here you see the smiling face of a naive young American who had no idea what he had just signed up for. And I was to really go through, uh, I don't want to call it traumatic, but it, well, it was traumatic because we were working, it was modern slavery. We were working from 9 a.m., unfortunately this is not allowed anymore, from 9 a.m., at least in the Western world, from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. with three hours break in between the services. So we would start on Monday, sorry, Tuesday morning, we'd come in and we'd work doing the prep. We'd have a break for lunch. Then we'd go to our, do our service again, clean up our stations, go home, or go home, home, go to our little boxes. We were, you know, living in the six square meter Chambre de Bonne we were renting for 300 francs. Sleep for three hours and then come back 
to work at 6 p.m., do our prep work, have dinner again, and then finish at 11 or so and clean up our stations. Um, so I, I've spent a little bit over a year doing that before I realized that maybe I really wasn't cut out for this. <laughs> um, but I will say this. I learned some things during this period that have stayed with me for my entire life. Now, what I'm going to tell you, I have to warn you, it's not revolutionary, it's not groundbreaking, and it's basically common sense. But I can tell you in my 40 plus year career, I have seen so many cases of people not applying these things, not understanding or, and, and missing business deals, uh, breaking relationships up, uh, missing opportunities because they didn't do these very specific or very, very simple things. And I would like to share them with you today. One of the first things I learned when I was in the kitchen especially because I had my CAP, but I was, this, was a, this was a very, very busy kitchen doing 135, 140 covers at each service. Uh, very busy. Um, the, the curiosity, I mean, people are basically curious, but the use of curiosity is very important because it can show you're interested in things. Too much curiosity, it means you're wasting time and you're a pain in the rear end. Not enough curiosity means that you're not interested and you're just kind of not really interested in what's going on. And having the right curiosity, asking the right questions at the right time shows the people you're talking to that you understand what's going on and you're able to identify what the key success factor is in and, and what you need to understand what's going on. And, you know, you hear the expression, there's no, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I beg to differ. I found out very careful, very clearly, when I asked a stupid question in the kitchen, I, the, I mean, the reaction was immediate and, and brutal. So uh, I think that you really need to understand, to show that you understand things, ask the right questions at the right time, and you will really win people over. The next thing I found out, and this was really the hard way, is attention to detail. Um, I would come in in the morning at 9 o'clock, and as the kumi, I would have probably, oh, 15 or 20 wooden crates filled with turnips, carrots, onions, garlic, Shellfish, uh, game birds, and uh, 12 dozen eggs, 144 eggs that I would have to separate. So I spent my entire morning um, peeling, slicing, dicing, shucking, cleaning the birds, and separating the eggs. Now, when you're separating 144 eggs, the yolks from the whites, to make both soufflés and oeuf les oeufs à la neige, for classic French dessert, you cannot get any shell in the whites, and you cannot get any yolk in the whites because that'll keep them from monter. Uh, you will not be able to make them into, you know, fluff and neige, as they call it, okay? And when I didn't do that, I found out even the tiniest speck of eggshell or yolk was also, once again, I was, the punishment was quite, actually, they were a little nicer to me because I was an American, but the chef did not, you, that was not tolerated. And when you were making Julien, when you're making a Julien of, of carrots, if all the carrots baton had to be the, exactly the right shape, the right sizes. When, you're, when I was peeling the artichokes, I still think about this. <laughs> when I was peeling the artichokes to get the artichoke hearts, if you didn't get all the leaves off and all the choke out and it was not perfect, I mean, you were just, you know, you were taken to task. And I ended up after about six months having these large, foul-smelling stains on my hands because I was opening up shellfish, crushing garlic, and I said, my God, this is going to ruin my life. You know, I'm never going to, no one's ever going to, I'm never going to find a girlfriend, you know, with these hands. <laughs> so fortunately, uh, those healed, and I was able to get over that. But that attention to detail still is something that is so important. And, you, and I see people doing this when I see emails with spelling mistakes, or I see people who are reading contracts over and not paying attention to what's written in the contract, or people who just don't pay attention. I mean, the detail is so important in everything in life, and it's, you really have to concentrate to do that. So I have to say, attention to detail is something I learned early on and has served me well in life. Humility is, I think, being humble. Being, you know, humility is something that shouldn't be, con it should not be confused with being weak or not being assured of yourself or not having strong conviction. Um, you know, it's very easy to be arrogant. And you in your professional lives, I know I have, you will come across arrogant people, arrogant peers, arrogant bosses, 
It's easy to be arrogant. It's easy to be aggressively sure of your position. The hardest thing to do is to be humble and to be, and, and even if you're sure of yourself, but to, to leave, the, leave the room for doubt. So, you know, I might be wrong, even though you know you're not wrong. I might be wrong, but I think this, okay? That's huge. And so being able to, it takes a, hu a huge amount of self-confidence to be humble. And I can tell you, I remember when I was in the kitchen, I would go down, and I was the only one who would go down into the basement and visit the dishwashers who were North Africans. No one in the team would come down, and, and, and I would come down and say, talk to them just to say hello. And they, their faces would light up because they, I was the only one who really you know, recognized them. And that sent a message to me. Um, and all throughout my career, obviously I had teams in my various jobs. I always had you know, direct reports. You know, I had some big teams. It's important to manage your direct reports, <clears throat> but it's also very important to go see the people who are the lowest people on the totem pole. Okay? And when I was, my last job in, in Dubai, where I had, was overseeing the culinary operations for 26 hotels around the world, and 11 of them are in the, in the, in the Gulf, in, in, in actually in the UAE, I had a total of 1,600 people. You know, obviously, I had about eight direct reports, but 1,600 people totally on my team. Many of them were stewards, dishwashers, uh, the cleaning staff and the and 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 the the the, the waiters uh, who you know keep all the restaurants running. We had we had 83 restaurants in Dubai, in the UAE. I would make a point of going down and seeing every single one of them at least during we had we'd have town halls and and with the stewards and with the the, the, the dishwashers and have a big round table and have, uh, let everyone go around and say their name. You know, hi, I'm, I'm, you know I, I'm, I'm Deepak, I'm from uh, Kolkata, I've been with uh, Jumeirah for seven years. And I'd ask them if there's one thing I can do to help you in your professional life, not your personal life, because I can't help you with your wife. Maybe you can help me with my wife, but I can't help you with yours. <laughs> what, what can I do? This is a, an amazing management technique to say to people, if I could have a magic wand and I could change one thing in your professional life to make your job easier, what would it be? Obviously, some things, if, if, the, if the person says, well, you know, make the, pit, the kitchen bigger, okay, that I can't do. But if they say, well, you know, we need more Gyarodons in, in during the breakfast service because we can't clear the tables fast enough and people are lining up. These are, huge, these are things that you don't understand unless you ask them. But when you do this to these staff, they remember you forever. And I mean, no one in the company did that. And it was, I, I still to this day, even I've been you know, out for almost three years now, I'll be out somewhere in Dubai or even somewhere else in the UAE, and I'll, someone will come up to me and say, oh, Mr. Ellis, do you know, remember me? And I'll say, of course I do. Of course I don't, but I say, of course I do. <laughs> and, and they'll tell me, you know, I, they, they still remember me asking them because no one ever has done that. I cannot emphasize that enough. It's so important for you to make sure that you know the people and you, you know, you don't, obviously you can't spend too much time with them, but at least you acknowledge them and you or, or care about their working environment. Concentration. Concentration is key. Uh, I remember when I was on the, uh, when I was stopped being a commis and when was I was finally on the line, the demi-chef de partie, and in the chaos of the kitchen, when there's banging and clanging and shouting, and, and you're listening to the chef to say to you, well, if you're on, like, for example, a salad station, okay, and you had, you know, you had an artichaut salad, you had a salad folle, you had asperge, and you had to ignore, you know, trois foie gras, un riz de veau, un Saint-Pierre. You had to listen for what the chef was calling out that you were responsible for. And that, mean, that meant focusing on and concentrating on exactly what was at hand and listening for that. And in today's world, with so many digital distractions, the ability to concentrate on one specific thing and get it done is absolutely key. Okay, listening and communicating. This is also something that's so important. I mean, listening when... How many times have I seen people talking to each other and I understand what one person is saying, but the other person is so convinced they know what the other person is saying, they're not listening. It is so important to not have uh, prejudgments about what other people are going to say. Make sure you understand them. Take the time. Repeat back to them. Did I understand? This is what I understand. You said this, this, and this. And that way you will really understand what they're saying. And also when you, when you talk to people, make sure that they understand what you're saying because you think it's clear, but they might not. Okay, and that is so, so, so important. Finally, um, just to sum up, um, I will, let's move forward. I, we talked about 1940 with Eugène Brasier. We, Eugénie Brasier. we talked about 1979 when I was uh, my fateful journey into the world of being a commis. Uh, let's uh, fast forward to 2011, August of 2011. The Michelin guy, the Michelin Corporation announces a much-awaited uh, news. They have finally found the new worldwide director for the Michelin Guide, a job, a post that had been empty for the last year and a half, creating great 
worry and concern in the culinary community. So, month of August, everyone's saying, why are they doing this in August? In France, if any of you know France, the entire country goes on vacation. And when they it's vacation, it's like no phones, no laptops, nothing. Everyone's on vacation, don't bother me, I'm at the beach. So August, well, when people saw what the announcement was, they understood. They were announcing that not for the first time in the 130-year history of the Michelin Guide, there was a non-French person that was named, and not only that, it was an American. <laughs> and to make things worse, this American came from the tire business. So I can tell you, the chefs went berserk. They went ballistic. They got, I mean, during, even during vacation, they said, okay, this is it, the end of the Michelin Guide. It's clear. They're going to sell it. They're going to close it. They're going to start putting American fast food restaurants in the Michelin Guide. This is the beginning of the end. It's the apocalypse. <laughs> Fortunately, I had my background being a kumi, and I cannot tell you how that was enabled me to win the confidence of the French cooking community. And at the end of the day, the Michelin Guide is in 27 different countries, but the heart, the berceau, as they say, the birthplace of the Michelin Guide is in France, and it's still the mothership for the Michelin Guide. And if you have the confidence of the Michelin chefs, of the Alain Ducasse, the Jean Robuchon when he was around, uh, Pierre Gagnier, uh, 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 um, Alain Passard, or the great Michel Gérard, the great French chefs, when you have their confidence, then that will come, that will, that, everyone will follow them. And so it took me about, oh, probably a good year before I was able to go around and introduce them all and explain to them, you know, I started, as they say in French, la petite porte. I, you know, hey, I know what it is to be a commis. And by doing that, by do having gone through that, it enabled me to win the confidence of the French chefs and enabled me to um, have a really a, a, a 32 years after being this, this wide-eyed, naive commis to have, to, in a very circuit circuitous route, come up and be the head of the Michelin Guide was uh, something for me I would have never imagined in, in my life. But I can tell you, I can attribute my ability to get to this job by those things that I learned when I was a 20-year-old commis, you know, peeling potatoes and carrots and cutting them up. And, and those life lessons have stayed with me for uh, as long as I have been working. And um, on that note, I want to thank you all again also for staying. Um, uh, so late here, um, and it's a great honor. I've been here several times in the past when I was at the Guide to talk about the Michelin Guide to EHL students, um, and I also want to say what an amazing place you have here, because I haven't been for a few years, but uh, it's really an amazing place, and um, the world of hospitality needs you all. I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge demand now. I mean, everywhere I go, people are looking, people need, the hospitality industry is, is, is stronger than it's ever been. And it's going to continue to grow, and, it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's schools like EHL and people like you who are going to continue to make the industry grow and become. And it's, 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 it's good for everybody because it creates jobs, it creates wealth, it, it creates um, uh, happiness. As Michel Girard said, you know, we're, we, nous sommes uh, marchands de bonheur. I mean, you are, you are sales, sellers of happiness, and, uh, and I think that's great. So thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you all in the future.